Morning, everyone. Uh, we are just going to hang on a minute or two to uh, allow for anybody else to join, and then we'll get cracking straight into the uh, into the webinar. Okay, great. We can see we can see the numbers are jumping up nicely. So uh, welcome uh, to the webinar that we're running today on Microsoft Teams phone. Uh, I'm Pete Basie. I'm Director of Modern Work at uh, NASTAR and I'm joined today by Ash Ward, who is one of our Microsoft consultants. Um, we will be going through uh, a whole bunch of topics. We will lead from uh, basically what the concept is around Teams phone how it's going to help, what sort of benefits you can drive from it. We'll then go into some architectures and how you piece it all together. Um, and we will look at what is the right sort of migration for you. And then we'll get on to uh, how we can uh, uh, help in more practical ways. Uh, I was just about to put a comment in there about please ask questions as you go through. Um, and I can already see that somebody's asking about Operator Connect. Yes, we will touch on Operator Connect um, as we go through this. Uh, so let's let's jump straight into it. Um, if you know this already, then um, please bear with us because uh, we have a, a, a wide range of uh, experience with um, Teams phone uh, attending this webinar today. What is it? it? It basically it is the ability to make and receive public phone calls. So your plus four four plus three three, whatever it is, uh, plus zero one, your 0208, it's your mobile numbers, your landlines, uh, it's all of those kind of public phone, public phone network uh, calls. And what we're really doing is taking a, uh, a platform like Teams and joining it to that public uh, phone network. So you need to look at how uh, the user experience is and when you want to use public phone uh, calling and when you want to use Teams calling. Uh, we'll also cover off the fact that it runs on uh, different devices um, and Microsoft have paid quite a bit of attention to try and make the user experience across the devices very, very similar. So whether you're using the Teams client on your laptop uh, or your desktop, uh, whether it's on a mobile tablet, something like that, uh, or even if you're going to be using uh, desk phones, it's a very similar look and feel uh, as you go through. Now, one of the challenges that uh, keeps coming up in in conversation is, is this an uh, enterprise grade solution? Uh, the answer from us is definitely yes. Um, you will quite often hear that, uh, you know, some of the, the sort of PBX vendors say, well, yes, we've got hundreds and hundreds of functions um, that the, the teams can't do. But when you look at the vast majority of users who make calls, receive calls, put them on hold, transfer them, um, you know, access voicemail, etc. You then start to run out quite quickly of the, of the standard functionality. Um, so yes, it is an enterprise grade solution. Uh, we have clients up to the 330,000 seat um, uh, count uh, using Teams as their telephony platform. So it is very much an enterprise grade solution. Um, and where Teams can't tick all of the boxes. Um, there are also third party uh, products which allow us to bolt into Teams to fill those gaps. Um, there are some native pieces in there like uh, auto attendance and call queues. So if you need to do call distribution, um, then uh, those are available. But there are also third party contact centers uh, and compliance based uh, recording solutions that allow you to uh, meet regulations even in even in some of the most highly regulated uh, industries. Um, 
couple of points just to note is that when you are deploying uh, telephony into a Teams environment and your Teams is already sort of relatively well established with your user base, this becomes a very easy add-on to users. It's quite an intuitive piece. There's an extra app down the left-hand side um, and when a call comes in, it call comes in the same way that it would do for, a, for an internal peer-to-peer um, -peer chat. Um, and the other thing to point out on this is that we are seeing quite a strong trend in uh, the way people communicate, um, certainly myself and I know the many other people in the organisation that we work for, um, don't tend to make and receive that many PSTN calls. It is certain functions within the business that do. Most people will send a message or an e email, book an appointment, whatever it is, uh, or use a federated chat um, uh, to establish. So there are definite functions that require telephony, quite often client facing or, or business to business. If we can just bump on then, um, please, Ash. Coming back to the, the heritage of Teams telephony, it actually goes back a lot further than um, the people think. It even precedes what's on the slide here. So, you know, going back to the days of OCS, uh, you had the ability to do remote call control, you could do basic telephony, um, but it was really linked 2010 that actually started to kick things off properly. And as it's progressed through the various different iterations, um, it's actually really now got quite a strong heritage. Um, and as I said, you know, there are third party apps. It's quite a rich uh, family in there of additional products that you can add into your environment to make it fit your needs. So we'll talk you through it as we go. Um, but you know, if we look at it at uh, face value, you know the, the telephony as we uh, know it um, in the Microsoft arena is now knocking on for about 13 or 14 years worth of, of solid experience. Uh, so it's not a new thing. If we knock on to the next one, please, uh, Ash. Um, some of the key benefits that uh, come out of adding your telephony into the team's environment is one of the big one is that um, people don't necessarily want to house separate PBX infrastructures anymore. Um, this does give you to eliminate the vast majority, if not all of your PBX solutions so that you use one platform. Um, so that's a, that is quite often a, a considerable argument when considering whether or not you actually want to uh, go down the route of team's telephony. It does then provide you with a far simpler a uh, solution to maintain. Um, so everything is in one place, everything's based off of the, uh, the Teams platform and it's really a case of if you have multiple different geographies where that number is being routed to. Um, you can also uh, use the Teams environment to provide, I can't say the word now, can I? Interoperability uh, between the legacy solutions. Um, and also between analog solutions. Uh, so if you have uh, various sort of lifts or whatever it is around the environment, uh, you, can, you can hook those in. One of the key things around being able to provide that interoperability is to allow yourself a nicely paced migration if you're going through um, a, a large number of changes or replacing PBXs, you can do it at your pace. Um, as I mentioned before, it is a, a natural uh, addition for those Teams users. And by the time that you actually uh, look at how telephony then bolts into your environment, you do end up with a far improved user experience, um, uh, in, in our opinion, especially when you then start to uh, include the ability to, uh, you know, uh, share to a, uh, you know, a particular function or a department, uh, which will come on later on. So those are the benefits. I'm going to hand over to Ash now to talk uh, on the more sort of technical components of this. Um, but please do, as I said, ask questions as we go through, uh, and we will try and answer them in uh, in real time. Thank you very much, Pete. Uh, so yeah, so now we know what Teams Phone is, uh, how it can benefit your organisation, and what your connectivity options when it comes to deployment. So you've got option one, which is calling plans. So calling plans being Microsoft's sort of native option, which is using Microsoft Azure PSTM provider. This is an all cloud solution and it's charged on a per user basis and you can port existing or buy new numbers. 
And an example for this would be in branch offices where potentially there's no core infrastructure or connectivity to other sites and you've only got an internet connection. Or maybe you just need to advertise a phone number because you currently don't have a telephony service in place. So then we have kind of option two, we've got Operator Connect, um, where this is operator managed infrastructure, which is particularly useful when potentially calling plans are not available, or maybe your existing telephony carrier already sort of supports this option, which allows you to leverage existing contracts, saving costs and allowing for a faster deployment, which again, we can we can put, put our existing numbers or start new. Um, the only thing with the with the carrier is they must be on the Operator Connect program, which is run by Microsoft. And the thing with Operator Connect is that this is all managed by the Teams Admin Center and it's very, very quick to deploy. So then we have kind of option three, which is Teams Phone Mobile, which is used to be called Operator Connect Mobile and it's kind of in the same arena. So this is one number for all, which is slightly different. So this is using a company owned SIM enabled um, phone number. So it's operator managed again, and it allows you to leverage the mobile network as well as internet connections. So you have one number being say a mobile number, 0777, 123, 123, etc. This number can leverage the mobile networks as well as internet connections as well, which is really good for sort of improved responsiveness and availability of your employees that are potentially out in the field. Um, and again, with this sort of model, the carrier has to be in the team's phone mobile directory, which is similar to the Operator Connect program, um, but it is relatively new, so there isn't much choice when it comes to the carriers at the moment. However, as the te technology is maturing, more carriers are becoming available. So then we've kind of got, we've got two more options. We've got direct routing and direct routing via carrier. So the reason I've kind of left these until after the first three is that the first three are all cloud based and they're all managed and deployed via the Teams Admin Center, requiring no additional hardware. But they do not allow for any interoperability with on premise systems. Are there any options for that, especially when maybe you own the required hardware? So this is where direct routing option four would potentially come in. So this allows you to leverage current hardware or maybe you, you do need to buy new. Um, you can connect virtually any telephony trunk. You can configure interoperability with the third party PBX telephony equipment, such as analog voice gateways, which Pete touched on earlier, deck systems and other PBXs. And if you currently have one, it allows you to use your existing carrier. Now, the only problem with this one, um, which isn't really a problem, is it depends on how far you want to go, depending on the first three options, is that this is much more technically involved. So, and it does require a level of knowledge around network design, is you're going to be looking at your firewalls, uh, core network, and you're going to have to get your security teams involved quite heavily around the likes of sort of public IP addresses, DMZ certificates, security access rules, etc. But then if you wanted to kind of move some of that responsibility away, but have that same sort of feature set, you could have direct routing via carrier, which in terms of connectivity is the same. However, then the hardware is owned and managed elsewhere by the carrier of your choice, which is, is really, you know, is really good. And we kind of refer to this as hosted direct routing. So it's the same sort of setup, but you, you don't, you don't physically own the hardware and it's not in your environment. And the beauty with all these sort of five options is they can be used independently. So you could just have calling plans and you could just have Operator Connect, but you can use them all together to build a solution that suits your needs. So say you've got multiple regions, multiple countries, you know, multiple sites, you could have one region with calling plans. You could then have direct routing for maybe your head offices, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's really good in that sense. So in terms of, the connectivity options we've got. We've got an example here of sort of the direct routing model, which is a really good way of showing the capability of, of, of Teams, of Teams phone. So you can see there's quite a lot here when it comes to sort of the on-premise infrastructure. We've kind of got the multiple SPCs at the top, which are hosted in Azure. These can be hosted uh, physically, virtually. They can be sort of in your own data centers, or, or again, they can be in Azure. Um, We've then got express routes, 
connecting the on-premise environment via multiple firewalls, and then we've got SIP trunks connecting out to the PSTM. So then from there, we have multiple data, cent data centers housing sort of servers, on-premise PBXs such as Cisco, Mitel, Avaya, all of the sort of standard PBXs that are out in the wild in the enterprise world. Um, and as well as kind of, you've got then the multiple branch sites, which have then got independent telephony circuits. You've got analog voice gateways for lifts, alarm systems, critical emergency phones. And again, all of this is integrated with Teams. So you, you can sort of short dial from um, potentially a, an analog um, emergency phone and you can land to a user in Teams and vice versa, just as an example. So with all these sort of details that you've got here, and the ability to sort of connect you multiple SBCs with failover, resiliency, redundancy, or even just um, different sort of regions. So you could have, again, we've got UK West, UK South. They could be serving different purposes and different, different areas. And the beauty with this is you've also got another option, which is um, we, we do get this asked quite a lot, is what happens if the internet connection goes down? Well, there is something uh, Teams offer survival branch appliances, SBAs, um, and that allows limited calling functionality even when the internet connection is down, which is just shows again how scalable and what is available in Teams phone, especially on the direct routing model. So as you can see from here, it can be as complex as required um, and it can suit most of sort of the enterprises telephony requirements, but it can also be quite simple too. You could just have say one SBC, um, and you just have one site with a bunch of phones that will still work with teams or you could then have a global deployment of 30 different SBCs across the world with a multitude of calling plans, operator connect, direct routing, all these different connectivity methods can build a much bigger solution. Um, and again with direct routing is you potentially can reuse existing investments in your current infrastructure. So I think with all that, again, what, what Pete was saying on the previous slides is this is this is suited for the enterprise world. Um, and we're finding more and more organizations potentially adopting this model in the enterprise world. So once we've kind of we've been through sort of an example here, we've been through some of the connectivity methods, we've got an idea of how to bring PST and calling into teams, what sort of calling features are available to sort of enhance the collaboration um in teams so we've got teams channel calling so many of you might have heard of this maybe not but we find that a lot of organizations weren't actually aware of this feature um, and the efficiency it's bringing to teams and so, so teams channel calling you can sort of see from the image there is that you're having calls coming through to a teams channel you being able to see your agents in your team you've got the ability to read voicemail chat dial transfer calls again this is all from the same pane of glass whereas potentially you may have had to have logged into multiple systems previously um, and potentially entered special codes etc to to get your voicemail and then if we follow on from that we've got shared voicemail which we just touched on is that shared voicemail leverages microsoft 365 groups which then allows outlook integration and it also can be controlled by your sort of corporate compliance policies as well and it is particularly good for sort of teams who are all working in different locations as you no longer have to log into these potential separate systems or you know the the voicemail system in sort of the back room where someone has to go in and enter a pin to get in there um you know that's that's all no longer required and you can also with the sort of transcription service that's built in, in teams you can see your voicemail and and you can listen to them all, all quite well so then We've got sort of Teams channel calling, we've got the shared voicemail. These are two really cool features we think are good for sort of collaboration in the in, in the enterprise world when it comes to calling. You've then got Teams Mobile, which we have touched on a little in terms of the connectivity side, but how can this sort of improve collaboration? So as we've discussed, you've got one phone number, and this one phone number is for users, whether they're on site or off site. And it's particularly useful again for field engineers moving between locations due to that use of mobile networks and internet connections, which again is approving availability and responsiveness of the users and allowing other users in your organization to get in touch wherever they are. And again, 
the thing with Teams Mobile, which is a little bit different, is that you've got mobile integration. So then you've got sort of your combined call history, again, voicemail and presence across all your devices. And it even allows you to use the native mobile dialer, which you can control using Teams policies and you can set that company wide or for a certain subset of users. Most things in Teams around calling are all basically policy based. So I hope that has given some sort of further into, in, insight into the connectivity options, a bit of an example of how it can all be put together um, and around some of the a few of the cool features we think are good for collaboration. Um, so now if I sort of pass you back to Pete, he's going to discuss some of the migration paths available and options to adopt Teams Voice in your organisation. Yeah, and I think, uh, thanks for that Ash, but um, just before we do move on, I think having the ability to bring all the communication into one place and into that uh, Teams environment also allows you uh, when you start to bring in uh, Viva and working hours and protective time etc it gives you a, a, a really good range of tools to um, to make sure that your users are working that sort of right sort of balance between uh, getting the job done and not flogging themselves into the ground and one of the things that we find uh, an awful lot of businesses like the idea of is not actually having to publish people's mobile numbers um, because when you've got a mobile number you know there, there is a tendency for people to go okay I can't get hold of them on teams or whatever it is I'll just go straight to their mobile so you can start to protect um, you know people's uh, social lives. As for choosing the the right migration path um, I guess really it depends on your uh, the, the the size of business you are, the geography that you have, uh, how complex your uh, your requirements are. Um, so when it gets to um, you know the, the discussion around this, the things that will primarily drive it are um, you know how heavily is telephony used? Is it used externally uh, to interact with partners and clients? Um, are you working in a uh, sort of a UK centric environment? Are you working across Europe? Um, are you looking at um, some of the other more challenging countries, the you know, the Chinas, the UAEs, the potentially places that have a lower uh, connectivity uh, speeds as well? So potentially sort of parts of Africa or South America sometimes uh, come up in conversation. And so we take into account all of these components, but what we're really moving towards is there may be three or four different components of the architecture options that the Nash uh, spoke about but your end user experience becomes the same in the sense that uh, you know a team's call once it comes in regardless of how it comes in will have that same user experience so we choose the architecture um, we look at whether or not uh, Teams needs uh, any third party components to be added into it, whether or not you've got uh, particular regulations. Um, and then we sort of work through what it looks like um, uh, from, a, from an overall picture. Now, once we've done that, depending on uh, what sort of size and scale of batch of migrations, we'll get put into a scenario where what is the most effective way to get you across? Uh, if you take some of the larger organizations, for example, the idea of migrating uh, four, five, six thousand, ten thousand people in one go tends to make people a little bit nervous. Um, and that's not what we want to do. So it might well be that we set up the connectivity, the interoperability, and we move people in batches of two, three, five hundred, whatever it is. We have actually moved. Um, 10,000 people in one go. Um, but that was from a Skype for Business Online platform into Teams. So the, the, the back end was all um, in place, ready to go. Uh, and the, uh, the, the number, the numbers, uh, so the, the, oh, the term's gone from my head. Um, the rules, the dial plans, etc., cetera, um, were all in place. So we could move those across quite nicely. Uh, other organizations, you might look at it and say, well, actually, we've got an office over here that's of 300 people. Maybe we actually do want to do that in one go because we can manage that from a, um, a migration perspective. And um, I don't know, Ash, I mean, but 
the way that we build out the migration piece the architecture is a conversation we have to have a conversation about that and where we're going to put the components but i don't know about you but i think from what i see there is a real mix now as to whether people go big bang or phased um it used to be quite heavily on the phase front i think people are getting much more confident about the number porting now yeah I, I was just about to say so what what we find is it it's, it's a really sort of great question that you're mentioning there is that the big bang or the phased approach is is talked about quite a lot when we're sort of in the early early days everyone's like okay we want to phase this out we want to do say we've got ten thousand users and we want to do a thousand a week over you know over 10 weeks as an example but what we find is some organizations potentially their service desk may not be able to cope on say we, we normally do this on on a friday we allow the weekend to happen because it's, it's a cloud technology things do take time to settle down but we find then say on the following week that the service desk may be sort of under quite a lot of load um, and if that's constant every week it's actually more than just going well let's we've been using teams we're only going to move our numbers over we're just going to move our users numbers at the moment none of the service numbers around sort of your response groups in you know in skype for business or to attend as core queues etc in teams or hunt groups on cisco systems we'll leave all those in place all the sort of main business service numbers and our users hardly anybody maybe makes a pstn call we'll move all ten thousand in one go because We'll have that one hit on the service desk everybody knows what's going on a week later it's settled down everyone's quite quite familiar with the system but then you have more risk averse organizations that go no we, we really need to phase this out we need to do it you know in a controlled controlled manner um and it's it really does depend on the organization the type of organization and their um their appetite for risk as well because you know it, again it, it's it is a cloud system so there is some sort of settling down period afterwards. Um, and I mean, me recently, I, I, I've been dealing with a, a phase migration for quite some time and it depends on the amount of users. If you've got 20, 30,000 users and the nature of what they, how they work, it, it's the same thing you've got, right? Okay, we made big bang that one site because that one site doesn't do um, anything that's sort of business critical as an example, but then you may find, business critical 24 seven users, you've got to be much more gentle, much more sensitive approach. And you maybe just control. You do that one sort of group in one go together and then all the focus is on this one sensitive group. So it is more around all the early conversations. And as you're working through sort of the program of works, what? What is your appetite and how do you want to move forward and what are your type of users? Because we all like quick wins, so maybe we just want to do the first few thousand users and then focus on all the complex cases afterwards. Cool, lovely. Thanks, Ash. Um, we've we've got an interesting conversation that's um, or question that's popped in. I, I think actually let's just cover off the last two bits and then we'll come to that one because I I I'd quite like to explore that one with you. So if you just want to bump on again, um, one of the things that you can do uh, really with this is to basically just start the conversation you know it, 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 there's no pressure to uh um you know to, to, to sort of push this one right the way through you can either just have a conversation with us we do modernizing communication workshops they will take you through the sort of the end-to-end -end piece even where it includes um you know uh, talking about adoption and change management how you make sure you get proper buying from the users it will cover things like the compliance call recording and and so on um but it will also touch on the architectures and the kind of things that you need to um uh to consider when you go through this this is all about planning i think in in my mind uh, if you if you think it through and plan it out uh, you won't come unstuck um it is a uh, a, a now as i said a well established um uh, tool within the, uh, the within the business arena so if we can skip on again i think we're on to the questions piece so i'm going to throw this one straight back at you before i start proffering my opinion ash um okay at, uh, please could you elaborate on call recording for auto attendance or hunt groups in a safeguarding is education environment okay so 
elaborate in terms of the sort of we're talking from a technology point of view or sort of around the regulations so i i think you know there's there's a couple of angles the first the first thing i think is the the safeguarding piece right if you're if you're working in a safeguarding environment do you need to call record um that when we're talking about compliance and call recording and those sorts of situations we need you to input on um what those regulations are so the way that teams um handles the compliance based call recording is regardless of how the call um, ends up being distributed what you are doing is is effectively adding in um, a uh, it, it's it's a bot basically that goes into the call and says that you know ash works in a particularly uh, sensitive arena uh, we need to make sure that we capture all of his uh conversations in case we need to be you know in case, in case they need to be used um at a later date to prove or disprove or, or or reinforce the story that's going on um and so basically when ash gets involved in a conversation this will be um silently added into the uh, into the conversation and it will be recorded and recorded and, and stored and depending on what call compliance solution um you use there are belts and braces to make sure that we have actually captured all of Ash's recorded conversations. So it compares the um, the call records, as it were, to what has been captured and stored on the recording environment, and it compares the two and goes, well, actually, hang on a sec, there was theoretically another call there. So you have that measure to make sure that everything is is done. But really, from a, an end user perspective um if you're doing uh, a true sort of uh, call recording solution and you want to capture everything that cannot be then tampered with um that solution is is pretty invisible to the user unless you know you need to go back and have a look at what's been recorded etc um so it's all perfectly possible um the calls um depending on on how you distribute the calls so the the, the auto attendant hunt group pit that you were talking about um, depending on what the exact nature is uh, will define whether or not it's something that's done through native teams or whether or not we need to bring in a third party to make sure that you capture everything that you need to capture um, and as I said you know we have this running in um, a number of different uh, verticals finance um, legal uh health you know that kind of thing so um it's it's a well-established process we would just need to make sure that it uh fits what you need yeah and i would just just follow just following on from that is that you've also got the choice of whether you would like sort of the, the strict compliance solution which is uh, we like to refer to as compliance with the capital c so that there is no way you could potentially make or receive a call without it being recorded so we do find you know some some organizations need the ability for calls to be recorded um and say if for whatever reason the bot couldn't join they would still be happy for that call to go ahead but then again you flip it on its side and you can go well if that bot can't join the call for whatever reason there's a blip a connectivity issue that call cannot go ahead so then you've got to make those choices as well um, and again if you've got regulation specific sort of compliance policies that are in place we, we work with those to sort of make that system suit yeah and i think you know there are ways to ensure that the bot is fully functional etc the example that's actually been been put in i'm, I'm going to assume it's from the same person because it's just telling me that everybody's anonymous um uh for example a threat was given on a main number so that we can give it to the police or the authorities so the short answer is yes yes that yes. can be done um the uh, if you want to go into more detail as well just you know just 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 ping us a note afterwards and we're quite happily set up a, a, a deeper conversation for you that's not a problem um there is a question uh, on a practical level about the recording um, being available after said uh, will it be made will the webinar be emailed so yes it will be emailed out um, 
and it will actually be a recording of what we're presenting now. Um, so I don't know if there's a transcript going with it, um, but the full recording is, is going to be made available afterwards. Um, so we've got five minutes left. Uh, I'm not seeing any new questions come in, um, but uh, hopefully uh, everybody's got what they need to um, out of this. As I said, we're more than happy to go into uh, just additional conversations um, in private. Um, uh, if you don't want to ask the question uh, in the forum. Um, and I think really the the sort of actions off the back of this, if you can just bump on is, you know, just have a conversation. You know, you'll you'll work out quite quickly, I think, whether or not Teams is going to be viable for you. Um, you know, there are licensing considerations to take into account, but fundamentally the user experience and the simplified architecture that you end up with um, is a, you know, is a very strong contender for that. And of course, once you've really moved into cloud, you you know, you aren't potentially going to move back out. You might change vendor, but you're probably going to stay in, in some sort of cloud solution. So you've got the contact details on there. Um, we will publish those as well. Um, we've got a couple of last minute questions come in. We shall try and squeeze them in. Um, can you explain the Microsoft licensing a bit, please? Yeah, OK, fair enough. The licensing piece uh, depends on what component. Uh, if you have E5, for example, as a subscription, um, then it's uh, included in there. Oh, hang on a second. Got another question coming in on the same thing. Sorry if I've missed, but could you, oh, so it's also on the E3, E3 licensing. Um, so with that licensing, um, if you want the ability to use the direct routing, etc. Actually, do not ask you answer this one. I've got yeah. some questions to, to finish. <laughs> no, no, with. that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so as as Pete was saying, if you've got E5, you, you've you've essentially got the lot, and and in there there's a an add-on, and it's called um, Microsoft Teams Phone. It used to be called the 365 Phone System, um, and that Teams Phone add-on is what is required to license a user to use sort of any of these connectivity methods. Apart from calling plans, you require calling plans, which again is a separate thing and you get a bundle of minutes in there and there's lots and lots of detail we can go into about that. Um, and you then got the Teams phone mobile. There is a Teams phone mobile license add on to the Teams phone license as well, um, which isn't part of E5. I believe that is a separate add on to add on. Um, so you can just have a user with an E1 and just have to, uh, an E3 with just say Teams, and then you can get the phone system license and then add that on. Cool. Okay. Um, and then there was another question that's just come in, which uh, please can you give more information on what happens if the internet goes down? I, th I think the answer to that one is it depends what part <laughs> of the internet going down. Um, you know. And, uh, yeah. The, DR scenarios, as far as Stephanie Voice, have changed now quite considerably, um, and there are various different opinions. So you can potentially have uh, resilient interconnect internet connections. Um, uh, so if one goes down due to the provider, then you still got uh, services that will run. If it's something like somebody's um, put a digger through both of your connections outside your office. Um, then what we are seeing is a, a far greater trend towards people just having the mobile Teams client um, and they're up and running. So uh, I think, you know, there are, it is quite a resilient solution, um, but you do need to look at which use case or what scenarios you are trying to cover off um, with that DR uh, or, or with what happens when the internet goes down. Is that fair? Yeah, and it, and it depends on the obviously on the solution uh, on the method that you choose as well, because um, obviously when you start looking at more of the complex scenarios and when you've got say the likes of your survival branch appliances, which give you that limited call in, uh, it just depends on how how important calling is sort of PSTN calling, um, because like Pete was saying, if if say your office internet connection goes down, that means pretty much nothing will work. You know, your, your whole sort of suite of apps are going to stop working and you can walk outside and you can you can make a call on 4G on Teams. And that again, that's the beauty with it. 
Cool. Right, we're at time. Um, as I said, if you've got any more questions, feel free to throw them in. Um, we will answer any questions that, that have been put forward. I can see there's just one uh, internet at our office. So happy to go into that into more detail. Um, uh, you know, offline. Um, sadly, we are at time now, but um, thank you very much, Ash. Uh, thank you, everyone, thank for you. joining. Hope it's been of use. Um, and as I said, you know, if you've got questions, just just throw them to us, um, and we're quite happy to set up a conversation just to talk through the uh, the options. Thank you very much. <laughs>